I'd like you to turn in your Bibles this morning to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 6. Deuteronomy, chapter 6. Last week we introduced the uh, theme for the year that we've entitled Intentional Compassion. We examined the well-known parable of the Good Samaritan that is contained in Luke chapter number 10. And as believers, we have to become intentional in our compassion towards others. I think far too often we sit back and wait for the opportunities to uh, just naturally come to us. And it's my opinion that the Lord would have us do better as a body of believers uh, in this particular area. And in doing so, it requires that we... Uh, have consistent effort to reach out in ministry to those who are in need. And what I, I don't think is that we are a, a group of cold-hearted individuals who could care less when someone is going through a problem. At the same point in time, I also find that uh, we need to invest more time and energy and effort into meeting people uh, where they are and the needs that they truly have. And so that one, I want that to be our focus this year, and you'll find that at times, if you uh, will take this challenge on, that it's not going to be easy. You'll also find that at times it may not even be appreciated uh, by those who are receiving it. Yet those who are doing it, who are intentional in their compassion, will soon uh, discover that it demands even being compassionate towards difficult people. <laughs> and disagreeable people. And when you determine to be intentional in your compassion, you'll discover that it takes a lot of work. It's gonna take a lot of effort and a lot of energy. But I'd also say that it is something that there's a great reward in demonstrating intentional compassion. I'm not suggesting that our reward is immediately evident, nor am I suggesting that your efforts are always going to be received well. But when we are proper in our motives, we are laying up for ourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. Obviously, the rewards of which we're speaking are eternal in their nature and they are incapable, therefore, of being taken away. These are not subject to man's approval, acceptance, or even man's praise. They are instead motivated from a desire to please the Lord. And we are in, to be intentional in our compassion, but yet we're not to draw attention to our display of compassion. We don't go around waving flags and announcing to everybody what we do and what we have done and, and all of the hours that we spent ministering to so-and-so last week or listening to this and the hour-long phone call that we received. We don't do that. We don't come along patting ourselves on the back in any way trying to uh, display or attract attention to ourselves. If you are an individual who is seeking the attention, the approval, or the praise for man, I can assure you that you are motivated improperly. Matthew chapter 6 uh, teaches that those who serve with a motive of attracting attention to themselves have their reward in full. In other words, the extent of their reward is what they receive from man. They are earning no reward from God. But I also believe that intentional compassion has to be properly prioritized in order for it to be of lasting value. There are many who have engaged in humanitarian efforts, but yet they never earned any eternal reward. Why is that? Well, it's love, for one, may not be properly motivated. And so as we've got the various banners up, I believe that intentional compassion begins first and foremost with God. And that's the section that we want to focus on today as we attempt to become intentional in our love for God. It's only then, I believe, that we can become intentional in our love for others. And this is the focus here of Deuteronomy chapter 6. It's easy for an individual to come along and to make the claim, I love God. In fact, you've probably had unbelievers even make that very same claim. They'll come to you and say, well, well, I love God. It's very easy to stand and sing loudly, oh, how I love Jesus, but yet live a life that is contrary to that claim. 
Let me ask a question. Is the mere profession of love for God equivalent to the reality of love for God? No. Just because someone comes along and says, I love God, does not automatically mean that they do. Uh, our assumption oftentimes is that, well, somebody who's in church must love God. Well, that's not always the case. Sometimes people are in church. I'm honestly not sure why. <laughs> uh, maybe it's to check off some duty with me. I, I don't know. But uh, just because someone sits in a pew does not mean, well, I have a love for God. A profession of love costs nothing to make. For me to stand up here or you to sit there and say, yep, I love God, that costs you nothing. Three words than the breath that it took to say them. Depending on how loudly you said that, maybe even a little bit of spit that came out. Okay, who knows what. That's the extent of the sacrifice, however. But a life that truly loves God demands sacrifice. And that's the difference. And it's the latter part that we want to put a focus on. And I will say this, that a Christian who is knowingly disobedient does not love God as he ought, regardless of what he might attempt to claim or even portray. In order for us to become intentional in our compassion, we have to first become intentional in our love for God. Notice the passage in Deuteronomy chapter number six. The Bible says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. It's the only two verses that we're going to take a look at here this morning uh, out of this passage, though many other passages will be cited. Let's begin by noticing, first of all, the foundation of a love for God. Every Jew would recite what is known as the Shema, it's the, from the Hebrew word meaning here, and it was actually taken, uh, one of these passages was this one that we just read, Deuteronomy chapter 6. Every Jew, it's essentially a creed by which every Jew attempted to live, and they would recite three different passages from memory twice every single day. One of those passages was Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9. And then they read or recited rather Deuteronomy 11, 13 through 21, very similar in its uh, teaching, as well as Numbers chapter 13, uh, or 15 rather, verses 37 through 41. Twice a day, these verses would be recited. And we won't take the time to compare uh, each of the passage, but in essence, they teach much the same thing. They teach the necessity of loving God wholeheartedly. They teach the necessity of instructing children spiritually. And they teach the necessity of obeying God's commands entirely in order that they might receive the blessings of the covenant. If we were to go back into this time frame, what we would say is the law as was given to Moses was to govern every aspect of their lives. They were to surround themselves with it, even as you read on in Deuteronomy chapter 6, so that it would be such that it would always be kept in the forefront of their minds. All throughout the law, what you find is that obedience to the law would result in the blessings of the covenant, but disobedience to the law would result in all of the punishment that would be prescribed in the law. And so because of the importance and the implications of obedience and disobedience, it was absolutely vital that families be instructed in the law. If they failed to do so, the succeeding generation would be incapable of satisfying the demands of the law because they would not even know the requirements of the law. Uh, there's a no doubt a lesson for us as spiritual parents and the necessity of being sure that our home is truly centered on the Word of God. Parents have the responsibility first and foremost to instruct their children in a way that honors God. It's not the school's responsibility. It is not the church's responsibility primarily. It is primarily with that of the parents. And until the parents take that reign and do so, it is seldom successful. 
Uh, the influence as a parent that you have on your children far exceeds what we can have as a ministry on children. That doesn't negate uh, the importance, but it begins with the home. We also need to understand there was a relationship between the law and Israel and God. The law was never a means by which Israel could somehow earn favor with God. Never once, including in the Old Testament, was a person ever declared righteous by God because he observed the demands of the law. Instead, he was declared righteous by faith, and therefore he observed the demands of the law. The demands of the law, the obedience of the law, or obedience to the law, rather, was a means by which they could demonstrate their love to him. God revealed his will to them through the law, and obedience to that law demonstrated that they had a genuine love for God. If you pick up any commentator, you'll just soon discover that the interpretations of Deuteronomy are, are quite varied, and, and uh, lots of arguments are there, and, and we're not certainly going to get into all of that. One, uh, and how they approach it, and, and how we approach it from different perspectives. One looks at it from a perspective, and this is a more modern approach, um, that looks at it what's called a suzerainty treaty. And basically what happens is uh, it was an ancient treaty that was formed between uh, what was known as a suzerain or a lord and a vassal, which would be the subject. Oftentimes it entailed uh, one country or king conquering some sort of territory. And what it did was it explained the basis and the expectations of the relationships between the two. And that is... I think very easily able to be seen here. It does kind of explain some passages, but probably a more common approach. And if you just look at the book from the perspective of reading straight through it, what you discover is that it centers on what seems to be about three speeches given by Moses. The speeches were given on the plains of Moab shortly before his death. The Israelites were about to cross into the promised land. You've perhaps gone to college and expanded the uh, four years into five or six years, okay? I'm uh, currently enrolled on the 73-year program and uh, should be due in about 2076 when everything is done and, and uh, we'll see what happens. But uh, these Israelites almost exceeded even something that probably you and I could do. It took them 38 years to make an 11-day journey. Deuteronomy 1 talks about the fact that it was really only 11 days to get from where they were to Kadesh Barnea, where they should have been. But you remember what happened when they got there. Out of the 12 spies that were sent, 10 of them said, we can't do this. And they uh, got all of the people saying, we can't, we can't, we can't. And God said, this generation is going to die in the wilderness, except those who are 20 years old and upward. 38 years later, on the plains of Moab, here is a group of people about to enter into the promised land. And they needed to reaffirm their commitment to the law. And so here is Moses standing up and giving these various speeches. And he begins with what is stated in verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. What's the foundation of our love for God? Number one, I believe it's the understanding of God's nature. The word here would suggest this is something to which they were to devote their attention. This was something to which they were to listen to. The phrase has been interpreted a variety of ways, but it seems best to understand it as being this, God is one in essence, but he manifests himself in three persons. It's the concept of the Trinity. There are some who oppose the concept of the Trinity. They would suggest that uh, that somehow contradicts the unity of God. But let me clearly establish that both the Trinity and the unity of God are both biblical concepts. Some might say, well, well, you'll never find the word Trinity in the word of God. Therefore, it's not taught in the pages of Scripture. Or it is a concept that is uh, unbiblical or should not be established. Well, there are lots of words you don't find in Scripture. For example, you uh, do not find the word gravity in Scripture. 
but we can't reject the concept of gravity because it's not found in Scripture. If you want to argue from silence, then go jump off the gymnasium roof because gravity is not taught in Scripture. <laughs> the word isn't used. Well, the concept is certainly taught there, and the concept is clearly demonstrated in our experience. And others say, well, well, we just can't understand it, therefore we will reject it. There are lots of things we struggle to understand. Now, the Bible clearly teaches that God is, in essence, one. It also clearly establishes that there are distinctions made within the Godhead that include three separate persons and functions. There's no contradiction, however, that exists in that because the contradiction, by definition, says we've got two opposing ideas. It is difficult to explain, but it is believable. Do we comprehend it? No. Why? We've got the finite mind attempting to comprehend an infinite God, yet we still acknowledge that the reality exists because the Word of God says so, and I can believe what the Word of God teaches. Understanding a proposition is one thing. Comprehending it all is an entirely different thing. And we are okay with that on lots of levels until it comes to this. And so the argument that says, because it's incomprehensible, I can't accept it, really is not all that valid. We also find that the essence of the Trinity would suggest that a person may be singular in one sense and plural in another. doesn't contain a logical contradiction because he is both immaterial and material components. <laughs> it's not incompatible with unity. Uh, God instead would be one essence who is existing or manifesting himself in three persons. Now that does not mean, and we got to be very careful that we don't think of three distinct people, like Peter, James, and John, for example, who occasionally blended on a couple of ideas. That's not the case with God. God um, has different ways, different, different persons, different ways in which he manifests himself, but they all form, in essence, one God. And so what you have is a declaration here that God is one God. He is a single God whose mode of existence is in three persons. We're not saying there are three separate gods. He is one divine God being. And every aspect is equal in power and glory. Secondly, there is a regard for God exclusively. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Here's the understanding of God's nature. Now you as a believer, you as an Israelite in this passage, must regard God as being exclusive. God is not simply a God among other gods. He's God alone. No other God even exists. And when you understand that, you'll find out very quickly, then that by definition demands total allegiance and it eliminates even the concept of idolatry. All throughout scripture, we find an abundance of passages that teach God or the brother that teach there is only one God. And I'm not going to go through uh, all of these passages. Let me just mention just a few of them. First Kings chapter 8, Solomon said, The Lord God of Israel, there is no God like thee in heaven above or on earth beneath who keepest covenant and mercy with thy servants that walk before thee with all thy heart. Isaiah chapter 44, Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first. And I am the last, and beside me there is no God. Isaiah 45, verse 5, I am the Lord, and there is none else. There is no God beside me. I girded thee, though thou hast not known me. Paul, in addressing the matter of eat meat being offered to idols and whether it's appropriate for a Christian to eat that meat, wrote in 1, King, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, as concerning, therefore, the eating of these things that are offered in sacrifice and idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world and there is none other God but one. 
One's view of God is foundational to his love for God. Let me say this a little differently. Until God is established exclusively, he cannot be loved wholeheartedly. Until you reach the point in your own mind, God is all there is. He cannot be loved wholeheartedly. Many Christians are content with divided allegiance. They claim loyalty. They claim, I love God. But their life doesn't back that up. Jesus stated in Matthew chapter 6 that no man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will cling to the one and hold to the other. You cannot have a divided loyalty. The nature of who God is. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Demands that he be loved exclusively and that he be loved wholeheartedly. There cannot be division or half-heartedness in our love for the Lord. He continues into verse 5 where he says, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. What is the heart? The heart is the seed of emotions and understanding. Oftentimes in Scripture it's conveyed by the concept of the mind. We're not talking about the blood-pumping organism that exists inside of your chest. This is the seed of the emotions, the seed of the understanding. It's the mind. The soul is the center of man's will, center of man's personality. When the Bible says you're to love the Lord with all your heart, with, we might even say, all of your mind, and with all of your soul, with all of your being, your love for God is to completely, uh, is to envelop every single aspect of, of you. If that happens to the individuals to whom Moses is speaking, if every single person took and said, I am going to love God wholeheartedly and exclusively, what would end up happening to the entire nation? The entire nation of Israel would love God wholeheartedly and exclusively. But it began with each individual determining, this is what I'm going to do. Throughout Deuteronomy, and there are many passages, I think it's around 20 or so, that uh, into the Israelites, just in Deuteronomy alone, are urged to love God. And often you'll find that this love for God would be evidence in obedience to his commands. This was foundational then to receiving the blessings that are prescribed in the covenant. In fact, I said nearly 20 times, I got the statistic here, it's actually 11 times in Deuteronomy alone, uh, the Israelites are urged to love God. I think the word love is found more than that, but yet when it specifically is related to love God. What is Moses saying? Your love for God is foundational to your life. Your love for God is to encompass every single aspect of who you are. Just as it's the case that if every individual Jew would say, I'm going to love God entirely, then all Israel would love God entirely. The same is true here. Narrow the focus just a little bit more. If each individual in a home decides, I as an individual am going to love God wholeheartedly and exclusively, that home would love God wholeheartedly and exclusively. But problems are inevitable when one or neither says, I'm going to love God wholeheartedly. Many Christian homes, I'm going to love God half-heartedly. 
And the other half, I'm going to love what I want. You see, there's God and there's my life. And as long as I can have fun in my career and, and do well in school and do all of these things, then, then it balances out because, I mean, after all, I, 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 you know, I give God his part over here. I give God his 10%, the remaining 90% of my finances is mine. Well, I give God time on Sundays, the rest of the time throughout the week is mine. You see? That is a divided loyalty, divided love. In that case, in, in each of those examples, the individual who is described does not love God wholeheartedly. Because the individual who does says, God, all of this money is yours. All of my time is yours. Everything I do is to bring honor and glory to you. Why? Because I love you. And so, Lord, when I'm at work, I'll work in a manner that suggests I have a love for God. I won't allow attitudes that are contrary to uh, this, con uh, contrary to what God has established in the Word of God that would in any way indicate my love for God is not what it ought to be. You ought to love God with all of your heart. Consider just a few passages, Joshua chapter 23 and verse 11. Take good heed therefore unto yourselves, and this is towards the end of Joshua's life, that ye love the Lord your God. What better words could be stated as someone is about to die? Whatever you do, love God. Because if you do, you're going to do what's pleasing to him. That just encompasses it all. Love God. That means your attitude's going to glorify God. Love God. That means you're going to graciously accept everything, good and bad, that he gives you. Because those are just more ways through which you can love him. We don't have that perspective very often, do we? Lord, why are you doing this? Lord, you're killing me. Lord, I can't handle this. Lord, why has everything got to be so negative in my life? <laughs> Perhaps that's a perspective. <laughs> it's not God's fault, but nonetheless, uh, we, we often reason through things this way. Love God. He, another passage, Psalm chapter 31. O love the Lord, all ye his saints, for the Lord preserveth the faithful and plentifully rewardeth the proud doer. First Peter chapter 1, whom having not seen, ye love. In whom though ye now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Here's one well known, 1 John chapter 4, verse 19. We love him because he first loved us. What a simple way of just simply expressing how our love for God ought to take care and characterize every aspect of our being. We see the foundation of love, but I want us to see, secondly, the indications of love, because it says, I've already mentioned one thing to simply say the words, I love you, but it is entirely different to live a life that is consistent with that profession. Just as humans, uh, love for humans rather is directed by certain tangible efforts, love for God is likewise evidenced by certain attitudes and actions. And these attitudes and action, these indicators, help us evaluate whether our love for God is merely profession or whether it is reality. Let's begin by noticing, and we'll only cite two of them. The first one is a hatred of evil. It's stated in Psalm chapter 97 and verse 10, Ye that love the Lord hate evil. There's an attitude of hatred towards anything that is in some way displeasing to the Lord. 
If you truly love the Lord, then you will hate everything that is contrary or displeasing to him. That does not mean that you get to go around and hate everybody who is displeasing and contrary to him. But you will be, however, repulsed by sin. You won't be able to just simply excuse it and say, well, well, it's okay. This is just the way that I am. Let's ask a question, and I think it's fairly logical to see this. Do you think that the Israelites loved God as they were forming a golden calf to worship? No. Awfully hard to say, isn't it? God, I love you so much. Thank you for blessing us with all this jewelry. We'll take your provision and we will worship that. Boy, there's a message all in and of itself. You remember, they were given those things as they left Egypt. Those very things became the center of their worship. God's blessed us with many, many, many things. It is very easy for those things to become the object of our worship. We need to be very careful. But it is quite clear, the Israelites could not claim to love God while at the same time creating this golden calf to worship. In the New Testament, there were a religious group of people known as the Pharisees. They claimed to love God. In fact, they were even regarded by other individuals as people who really loved God. But Jesus had a different perspective. He stated in Luke chapter number 11 and verse 42, But woe unto you, Pharisees, for ye tithe mint and rue and all manner of herbs and pass over judgment and the love of God. You guys have got tithing figured out because you're even tithing on your spices. That's tithing. I don't need your spices, okay? <laughs> but uh, you're tithing on your spices. But yet, you missed a love for God. It's easy to throw a few dollars in an offering plate. Why do we do so? When we pass those offering plates, there's a bigger focus than us trying to get your money to spend. This is another means through which we worship God. Amen. God, you've blessed me so much. Here is simply a way that I can give back. Thank you for all you've done. How many times does that mindset characterize us as the offering plates are, are passed. Because of the contrasting nature between God and evil, James was able to write this, ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. You ever been irritated by carnal Christians? You ever wondered how they can do such and such and how they think they can get away with such and such? Guess what? They're not. Okay? They're not. Well, it sure seems like it. Well, adjust what seems like it. I say all the time, adjust your feelers. Okay? Because your perspective is all right. God knows this. God knows the heart. And James, in, a, in his usual blunt fashion, I, I've always felt like whenever I've studied James that I step into a boxing ring. Uh, and about the time I, I finish one section, I get another a right hook. And then it's a left. And I'm just constantly, boom. Okay. And that's the way James writes. You know what? Whoever's a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Boom. Okay. And he doesn't waste any time. He doesn't go to these lengthy arguments that Paul does in the book of Romans that take three chapters to read to then conclude this. Now James just comes out and punches you right square between the eyeballs. This is the truth of it. 
And whoever is a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Why do we say that? Because the two are polar opposite in each other. We cannot claim then to love God and at the same time tolerate or condone sin to any degree in our own personal lives. And if you're sitting there thinking, well, I wish so-and-so heard that, you need to hear it again. Okay? Well, I sure wish my spouse was listening to this. There's a bigger problem. Because you cannot condone or tolerate sin in your own life. Isn't it interesting how bad it looks in everyone else's life, but it's okay in ours? If our children had the same attitude that characterizes us as adults, we'd wear them out. But it's okay when I have it. You can tell my children, stop being grumpy, but it's okay if dad's grumpy. Stop complaining, but it's okay if I can complain. I just don't want them to complain, because I'm the spiritual leader in my home. Rather pathetic spiritual leader, if that's the mindset. It's very easy to identify everyone else's flaws. But when you look in a mirror, you see one person. And when you're looking truly into the mirror of the word of God, it's pointing right back at you, Amen. not everyone else. We cannot knowingly and intentionally enable others to commit wrongdoing while at the same time claiming to love God. The two are incompatible. Paul wrote in Romans chapter 12, verse 9, let love be without dissimulation, without hypocrisy. Abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. This love is not just directed towards others, but it's also directed towards God. Your love for God should be without hypocrisy. So abhor what is evil. Tenaciously cling to what is good. Amen. Well, we'd rather tolerate evil. We're to abhor it. It involves, one test is the um, hatred of evil. A second one is the commitment to obedience. Obedience to God demands that we sacrifice our own desires, comforts, and resolve to please him regardless of of the cost. Far too many believers are content to only please him when it is convenient, comfortable, and popular. But the real test comes when any one of those is removed. It's no longer popular, it's no longer easy, or it's no longer comfortable. Let me ask a question. At what point will you stop obeying God? The person who truly loves God has no such point. Think about that. At what point will you truly, will you stop obeying God? If you claim to have a love for God, you have no point. You'll always obey because you simply love him. Scripture abounds with passages that indicate the relationship between love and obedience. Joshua chapter 22, take diligent heed to do the commandment and the law which Moses, the servant of the Lord, charged you to love the Lord your God and to walk in all his ways and to keep his commandments and to cleave unto him and to serve him with all your heart, with all your soul. John chapter 14, if you love me, keep my commandments. That's really not that complicated. If you love me, do what I tell you to do. We're not quite as committed to doing what he tells us to do as we'd like to say we are. John 14 still, verse 21. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. What's the implication? The one who does not keep them does not love. And he it is that's loved my father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. Then you go into 1 John and you find out that that person's probably not even saved. That's a whole, the next series that we're going through, by the way, in 1 John. John chapter 14, verse 23, Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, 
he will keep my words. And my Father will love him, and he will come to him and make our abode with him. He's a saved person. What characterizes saved people? Obedience to God. What characterizes unsaved people? Disobedience to God. So if you are a professing Christian content to live in disobedience, what does that say about your salvation? Brings it into question. And it may be nothing more than an empty profession. 1 John chapter 5, verse 3, this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. Oh man, it's so hard. I got to do all this stuff. No, that's not a love for God. That is an obligation. But that's not what God would have for us. As I conclude this, I remind you, you can't be intentional in your compassion towards others until you first become intentional in your love for God. The person who is intentional in his love for God is going to choose to make time for him so that he can draw closer to him. This person will hate anything that contrasts God's nature and he will strive to obey him at all costs. Without a doubt, the standard is high, but I also believe the expectation is very clear. Don't be content with a mere profession that sounds good on the outside. Become intentional in your love for him. That statement I made a while back I find to be uh, quite important as we move on later into this next section. Until God is established exclusively, he cannot be loved wholeheartedly. If God's not first in your life, I don't care what you say, you do not love him wholeheartedly. If there are things that have crept up that have taken first place in your life, those are God's to you. And he is not exclusively established. Does God reign first and foremost in your heart? That's the real issue. And are you living a life that is obedient to him? It's not always easy. It's rarely popular. Seldom will you feel comfortable. <laughs> God often has us do things that cause us to squirm just a little bit. Lord, I'm not sure that I want to do that right now. Keep thinking that way. Eventually, he'll make sure you're wanting to do that. <laughs> uh, I would urge you to just submit to him. It's a whole lot easier. Uh, God can make squirmers squirm even more. And uh, he can twist arms. And, and he doesn't force his way on people. But he sure can make us willing to do it. Okay? Let's not put God in that point. What's your view of God? Until you see him for who he is you'll probably not serve him wholeheartedly. But when you see him for who he is and when you see him for what he's done for you, I believe the joy of serving him will be yours.